Hey, thanks everyone for joining us. I'm Craig Lammer. I'm the executive director for the Autoimmune Hepatitis Association. I'm pleased to have with us again, Dr. Aaron Ermel. You all may remember Dr. Ermel who's been with us before on a number of our frontline COVID reports, but he's an assistant professor of medicine at Indiana University School of Medicine. He's also a specialist in infectious disease. So Dr. Ermel, thanks so much for joining us today. Thanks for having me, Craig. So we're having this special session primarily, Dr. Ermel, because we have just heard that the Johnson & Johnson vaccine has met emergency use re uh, requirement. We're gonna start utilizing this now across the United States. We were just hoping maybe for our members, could you briefly explain how the Johnson & Johnson vaccine is different than the other emergency use granted vaccines, particularly Pfizer and Moderna? Yeah, so um, it, it uses a similar concept, which is actually transferring uh, genetic material to human cells or to you, uh, the patient, to then make those human cells express uh, the protein from the coronavirus, the spike protein you may have heard of, uh, in a similar manner to Pfizer and Moderna. However, the difference is that the delivery vehicle, we call it, um, is actually another virus. So one that we can engineer and one that typically causes the common cold, this adenovirus. And what we are able to do is actually use the outer layers of that virus to hold on to and package the DNA for the spike protein uh, and then deliver it into the cell. So it uses the adenovirus receptors to enter the cells and then deliver that genetic material. So that's how it differs from our uh, Pfizer and Moderna vaccines, which have already uh, garnered their EUAs from the FDA. Gotcha. And are there other pieces or other things with this vaccine that, that are also make it more advantageous, particularly in regards to the way it's stored, how it's dosed? Yeah. So what I think the big wins, I guess, for this vaccine would be one in its storage, and then it can be stored refrigerated rather than frozen. Um, the Pfizer and Moderna vaccines require uh kind of a deep freeze, so down well below zero. Uh, so if you look at like in Celsius, like minus 80, so between minus seven, minus 80, that's a very hard temperature to maintain with most, you know, even just regular freezers. The, um, and so to have it refrigerated means that more people could store it uh, for a little longer. The second is that the way it's being studied is in a one dose fashion. So that they were looking at efficacy endpoints or how well it worked in COVID-19 just after one dose which was not the way the trials were done intentionally, at least with the uh, Pfizer and Moderna products. Gotcha, that's, that's great to understand. I, we wanna know a little bit more about the efficacy, but before we go there, I, I think the key question for our members, specifically in autoimmune hepatitis patients that are on immunosuppressive agents for years with their doctor visits, they're told, do not take live vaccines. But what you've told me is, is this is a live adenovirus that's being used as a vector. Mm -hmm. um, is this safe for immunocompromised patients? Yes, actually, and in the trial, there was no specific exclusion of people who have um, immunosuppressing conditions. So even if it was well-controlled HIV or medical conditions of any kind that hadn't changed in three months prior to trial entry, they were actually allowed to enroll. And I think the big point is that when we say an adenoviral vector versus like live vaccines, uh, I guess the big example that we can use is actually zoster uh, that maybe more people are uh, familiar with, but we, you know, we vaccinate against like shingles. Um, and the older version of the vaccine was a live shingles virus that had been weakened, but it's essentially the same shingles virus, more or less, that, you know, people could get, you know, as chicken pox when they're younger. This is actually a completely, uh, I guess, hollowed out virus so that we're really there using it for its capsid and not using it. Uh, for any of the other genetic material that would come with the, the uh, like a live or an infectious adenovirus. We're just using that outer shell as a delivery vehicle. So when it's engineered, there's no really little to no adenovirus genetic material available. So it can't reproduce itself at all. Right. So again, uh, kind of what you're saying is it really is missing the machinery that would allow it to propagate or, or replicate in a human, correct? Exactly, exactly. Mm -hmm. So I think that's reassuring. And, and you know, one of the things, at least in patients in my clinic, um, in regards to vaccination and the new products and how people trust these, um, is there other vaccines that use this technology? I think this has been a, an issue with the, the other 
uh, RNA viruses that we've had come to market as well for, for coronavirus? Yeah, I mean, and that is uh, what a lot of the skepticism, even among the professional community and even myself kind of early on was that until now, mRNA-based vaccines had not really been ever demonstrated to be that efficacious, right? So we were, I was a little concerned um, because of the way, you know, we were kind of putting our eggs in that type of basket, right? Uh, but they were trialed in a very rigorous manner, you know, each trial enrolling 30 to 40,000 people, which is sizable and not rushing through the safety procedures. The, this technology existed before um, the pandemic. So I, this is the other reason why we were able to move things along a little bit faster is we didn't actually start from square one. We'd actually already been working on vaccines of this type. I think a lot of people, when they will look for adenoviral vectors, um, this, the, they may look back to like the very early 2000s and see the history behind these um, and that certain adenovirus vectors were used for gene therapy experiments, which is completely different from what we're doing with the vaccines. And they're, they were early generation. These are completely different in that they've more or less been entirely hollowed out. And the genetic material is only used to generate that protein. It's not there to necessarily change your DNA. That's a, I think that's the biggest concept is that we're not there to actually change human DNA. We're just asking the cell to make an extra protein and then present it to the immune system. That is not a permanent change um, on, the, on the part of the human cell. It only does that and expresses it for a short period of time. That's perfect. I think that's really clear. So now that we know that it's safe, um, can you just briefly highlight some of the protection data from the trial? Um, and I think this has been in media, but again, in simple terms, how good does it work? Yeah. So if you look at just getting COVID, it's not quite as efficacious as our the Pfizer and Moderna vaccines and the way it was studied. So one might look at that and say, well, I'm, I guess I'm still at like a little bit higher risk of getting COVID. I could get these other vaccines where I'm less risk. But if you actually look at other outcomes, which people forget to look at these, which is not just you don't get COVID, but even if you do, then actually you're just as like uh, less likely um, compared to the other vaccines to be hospitalized or get severe disease. So I think that was the big point that I try to make is you might get it, but it's gonna be so mild and you're just as protected from getting severe disease um, as you would from the other vaccines. The other important point that probably everyone has seen in the news is the variant issue and how well these vaccines will work. Um, the way the trials and the timing of the trials were done, you know, the Moderna Pfizer vaccines weren't being trialed at the same time as we saw the rise of some of these other variants. Um, and that wasn't, those outcomes weren't necessarily looked at as heavily. The Johnson Johnson uh, vaccines were actually trialed in like Brazil, South Africa, um, Great Britain, other places where you hear a little bit more about these variants, and they were able to look at a little bit of um, variant specific, you know, looking at what the efficacy in each variant um, caused. And it, they were le it was less efficacious when it came to certain variants, but not to a degree that it wasn't worth giving the vaccine. It's probably the best way I can explain it, that actually it still offered some protection and actually offered protection against getting severe disease, which I think is the, the other point uh, to be made with that. Yeah, so I think it's important. I think one of the messages that we want to convey is it doesn't matter what vaccine you get. Again, I'm encouraging my patients to get the vaccine when it's available. But I'm also now seeing and hearing patients going to get vaccination and being upset that they're being offered the J&J &J vaccine, feeling they're offered a lower class vaccination. How would you respond to that? Yeah, I mean, I wouldn't say that it's a, I wouldn't call it a lower class uh, vaccine. And, and any of these vaccines... The, the way I think about it, they serve their purpose. I mean, if you look at the Johnson Johnson vaccine being as efficacious as it was with one dose, I mean, you get that level of protection across the population and actually the population itself benefits where you will probably be much less likely to get COVID and then definitely severe COVID and you're helping the people next to you as well. So that kind of reduction because the, the, you know, that one shot was in providing a lot of protection, whereas like one shot from Pfizer um, you know, within those first couple of weeks, there, there wasn't a whole lot of protection. There was some, there were scenes, but not quite to the degree that we were seeing with the Johnson Johnson vaccine and the way they were, uh, at least the way they trialed it. So I encourage people to get whatever vaccine they can, at least um, in the sense of the helping the, the population, also reducing their risk of being hospitalized. Yeah, absolutely. I think that is key. 
Um, you know, I think the scientific community, at least in the past few days, uh, at least a number of colleagues have been uh, shaking their heads, seeing that some mask mandates are evaporating in some states. Things are getting a little bit looser. This is anecdotally from my perception. How do you how do you give advice to some of our members that live in states where there's no mass mandate and there's this kind of push to normalcy? What are the things we should be looking out for? Um, what should we be doing? How do we approach that as uh, general public? Well, I mean, it's it's kind of the same advice I was giving back, you know, in the spring. I kind of feel like we're having this debate again. Um, just as everyone got comfortable with masking, we decided to pull away. But the is is actually doing what you feel is best for yourself. You know, if there's not going to be a mandate to it, but you feel like you're not as protected, it's continuing with the social distancing if you can do it, um, staying away from crowded places uh, like those concert venues, things like that, and wearing your mask. You know, a mask to you know, a mandate to wear a mask isn't a mandate to never wear a mask when it's released. So you can continue those behaviors on your own, uh, and that'll that'll offer actually pretty significant protection. Um, you know, even if others around you are not not masked. Yeah, so I think great point. And again, I, I think you have to look out for yourself. And again, there seems like there's strategies that can be beneficial. Um, Dr. Ermel, I want to just thank you again for spending time with us today. And again, all really important information. And uh, we'd like to thank our members too for watching. And again, advocate, get your vaccine, um, keep wearing masks, keep washing your hands.